Oops, this is Cheryl's. Uh... <laughs> I, I, I'm going to take this. <laughs> Good evening, colleagues, uh, this evening, on this auspicious evening. Uh, I want to greet uh, the Deputy Vice-Chancellors uh, that are here with us this evening, Professor Sheryl Foxcroft, our DVC for Learning and Teaching, Professor Andrew Kiet, our DVC for Engagement and Transformation. I also want to thank Professor Kiet uh, for uh, sharing in the program this evening uh, with us. Uh, I want to greet the executive deans of faculty. Uh, I want to especially recognize our executive dean of the Faculty of Business and Economic Science, Sciences, Professor Henrik Lloyd, whose faculty tonight is associated with this honor being bestowed on our colleague, Professor Stephen Marco. Colleagues from the Faculty of Business and Economic Sciences, I see you all. Uh, including our emeritus professor uh, that I see uh, here in front of us. Thank you, Prof. It's always a pleasure. Um, members of senior management, all the professoriate, and all members of the academy, uh, all our students and students of Professor Marco, and alumni and alumni association members, family members, friends and colleagues who are sharing in this celebration, and also those that are sharing online. Honored guests, ladies and gentlemen, I am pleased to welcome you all this evening to the inaugural lecture of our colleague, Professor Stephen Marco. I particularly wish to acknowledge and welcome his family, extended family and friends. The cycle of life that oftentimes means that some of those to whom much is owed for our achievements are sadly no longer with us to witness them and to share access to education. A lot of us can relate to that, Professor. Their appreciation of the role and importance of education was manifested in the fact that they would not allow absenteeism from school at any time. Today, the fruits of that commitment are evident for all to see. Had they been alive today, Professor, we would, we would have no doubt that your parents' pride and joy would have been unbounded. We also welcome and acknowledge uh, your wife, Mrs. Shamiso Marco, whom the professor proudly calls his precious wife, for supporting him during his absence and allowing him to steal her precious time. I would like to look at the wife of the professor. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for being here with us this evening. Uh, we are honored. Mrs. Marco, this time is indeed a very precious commodity. And in giving of yours so freely, we have epitomized love and support and contributed in a very fundamental way to your husband's success. And we know what that means to contribute to a life of building a professor. It takes time. Thanks and, and, and acknowledgments also go to your brother, Charles Marco, and sister, Respina, for their ongoing support. Pastor David Dupree and his wife, Anne, and Pastor Wilbert Mushandu and his wife, Doreen, whose spiritual guidance has underpinned your work, Professor, your academic journey, and your career. Your brother-in-law, Mr. Pascal Gouwe, for his support and encouragement, and nephews, Vusumzi and Mutle Nkosi, who helped him circle into the windy city. And I quote from your words. <laughs> your beloved friends, Patrick Mwanza and his wife, Don, 
and Gerald Chikosi and his wife Doreen for their steadfast support. You are all welcome to Nelson Mandela University this evening. We also today honor the extended family and friends of Professor Marco who cannot be with us but who have contributed in their own way to this significant academic milestone and achievement. It does indeed take a village to raise a child, as we say in Africa, and we all celebrate you wherever you are. A warm welcome is extended to the professors, colleagues, and collaborators that are here, that are regionally, and that those that are around the world especially those in the Faculty of Business and Economic Sciences who have supported and encouraged him on his long journey. I just want to say something about your faculty, Professor, that uh, the academics come out when their colleagues celebrate, and we welcome that. Together, we take much pleasure in witnessing this important professional accolade, which in true academic spirit we have all helped to nurture. We have all formed part of an enabling ecosystem that supported and catalyzed our colleague, Professor Marco's work over the years. And as such, you all share in this accomplishment. We thank all of you. Uh, our, our colleague's research makes an important contribution to the body of knowledge on financial inclusion in developing communities and contexts. His research adds to the growing body of evidence that financial inclusion promotes socioeconomic transformation and livelihood and enhancement. For our university, which has since committed to play, placing its asset base in the service of our communities and of our society, this is indeed a significant piece of work for us. Nelson Mandela University aims for a values-driven and transformative institutional culture. And we take genuine pride in our engaged scholarship, which seeks to co-create groundbreaking Africa purposed solutions to complex planetary and societal challenges. This is part of a broader strategy to contribute more meaningfully to alleviating human precarity. Your work, Professor, resonate strongly with this focus of our university. And for that, again, we thank you. We are honored to have you as part of Nelson Mandela University family at this point in your career. You could have chosen to be anywhere. We are proud of your accomplishments, and we are eagerly looking forward to listening to your lecture this evening. We congratulate you on your outstanding achievement. Being promoted to the level of a full professor is the pinnacle of achievement of a scholar and a solid affirmation by your peers of your lifetime work. I now request the Executive Dean of the Faculty of Business and Economic Sciences, the Professor Henrik Lloyd, to introduce Professor Marco to the congregation. I thank you. Nkosi Mazeneto. Vice-Chancellor Professor Mutwa, Deputy Vice-Chancellors Kiet and Foxcroft, fellow deans, academics, my colleagues from the Faculty of Business Economic Sciences in particular, friends, family of Professor Margot and of the faculty, and of course also our emeriti and alumni. Very welcome to tonight's inaugural lecture from Professor Stephen Margo that is entitled, What is the Future of Financial Inclusion? Allow me to share a short but powerful biography of Professor Margo and his achievements up to now. Stephen was born in Margo village in the Masvingo district in Zimbabwe. He is the second eldest of ten children in his family. He was educated in the primary and secondary schools of the Masvingo province in Zimbabwe. His tertiary education began 
1991 at the University of Zimbabwe, where he qualified with a BSc in economics honors. From there, he went on to achieve an MBA in 2004 from the Zimbabwe Open University, and then, of course, qualified with a PhD in development studies in 2011 from the University of Fort Hare. Other qualifications that Professor Margo holds is a postgraduate diploma in higher education and training from the University of Fort Hare, as well as a certificate in strengthening postgraduate supervision from Rhodes University. He also holds a certificate in supervision from the Zimbabwe Institute of Management. His employment history started off deep in education by being a school teacher at a secondary school in commerce and maths. And that, of course, explains the topic of tonight about financial inclusion. From there, he went to the Polytechnical College and became an economics lecturer, from where he then went into the private sector and became an administrative officer in uh, the Delta Corporation. And then he joined academia in 2003. And we find him today amidst our academics in our faculty in the Department of Development Studies. The universities that he worked for ranges from the University of Fort Hare, the Great Zimbabwe University, the Durban University of Technology, and then, of course, currently with us, Nelson Mandela University. In terms of his research and supervision experiences, Professor Margo supervised six doctoral studies, 37 master's qualifications, and 30 honors qualifications. He regularly acts as a mentor to his junior staff and specifically within the research domain. Also, as far as publications are concerned, Professor Margo excelled always, and with his total of 58 outputs, ranges from 30 DHET accredited journal articles, 13 peer-reviewed articles, numerous book chapters, conference proceedings, technical reports, and so on. Currently, additional articles under review awaiting publication. He's also read 52 papers at both national, or at national and international conferences. And at these conferences, he regularly chaired the panel sessions um, that he uh, took part in. He's also an external examiner on various um, studies. And to date, he has examined 11 doctoral studies 37 master's qualifications and two honors projects. He's also currently the guest editor on two journals with special editions. The first one being a management and economic research journal, a Scopus Index journal with the theme global economic issues, as well as on SAGE, the, the South Asian survey journal with the theme transforming livelihoods through financial inclusion, a Southern Asian perspective. He's also a reviewer on four international journals currently, and he also acts as an evaluator and an assessor on various promotion panels at uh, numerous universities in South Africa. He currently holds various offices within associations and professional bodies, just to mention some of them, the International Education Association of Southern Africa, the South African Development Association, or as we know it, SATSA. He's also a part of the Southern African Research and Innovation Management Association, or as we know it, SARIMA, and then also a member of the Research Ethics Association of South Africa, or as we know it, RISA. And then, of course, a member of the Development Studies Association in the UK, and also a member of Law and Development Research Network. Professor Margo is also a visiting lecturer and professor at various universities, and of late he's had these appointments at the University of Zimbabwe, as well as the Midland States University in Zimbabwe. He also undertakes various national assignments, and the, the latest assignment is that on behalf of the NRF, where he acts as a reviewer for applications um, in terms of grants 
uh, through the NRF. And of course, for me today, very importantly, Stephen is also the HOD of the Department of Development Studies and holds a very important office in our faculty research um, area. He's the chair of the Research Ethics Committee Human in our faculty and also the faculty representative of the Research Ethics Committee Human Institutional. And I've got the hard task to try and convince Professor Margot to stay on in that position because he reminded me that his term of office comes to an end at the end of this year. So uh, I will have to do some serious work to remind and to entice him to stay. And the reason is that Professor Margot has got that voice of calm and reason when he speaks. So it doesn't matter how difficult the situation is, and for those of you that do research, research ethics applications, you know how heated those debates can become. And Stephen has got the absolute ability to calm a rather tense moment down to a situation where everybody can listen to each other and come to an agreement. And for that, of course, Stephen will always be the person to lead ethics, but it's for me to try and <laughs> convince him. <laughs> With that said, ladies and gentlemen, help me in bringing Stephen to the podium to deliver his um, speech, inaugural lecture on what is the future of financial inclusion. Good evening, colleagues. Um, all protocols observed. I want to thank the Vice Chancellor and the DVCs. I want to thank um, our Dean, Professor Andrew Lloyd. I want to thank all the um, colleagues in the academia, in the university. Thank you for your support and the colleagues from the faculty of business and economic sciences. Um, I also want to thank um, my colleagues in the department, in the DDS family. We call it uh, the DDS family. So I want to thank them for their support. Also want to thank my um, guests. Uh, <coughs> The pastor has been introduced, and, and his wife, um, my wife, and the other supporting guests. So tonight, um, yes, it is my day. I want to welcome you all to this uh, auspicious occasion. Thank you for your support, unwavering support. So tonight, I'm delivering a lecture on what is the future of financial inclusion. Okay, so I'll give you the outline. It's not going to be a long um, lecture. So we have, uh, we'll start with the background. Then I'll go to the, you know, an explanation of what financial inclusion is give the overview, and then I'll also uh, slot in my journey there, and then get into the future of uh, financial inclusion before we come to the conclusion. I know that uh, adults, research says adults uh, take 10 minutes to get bored and um, <laughs> they can actually walk away if you don't deliver. So I'll try to uh, do that within the first 10 minutes so that we, you don't walk away. <laughs> Let me start with a story. There is this little story. An old woman visited the bank in the city to open an account. So with the uh, help of a friendly bank official, um, an account was opened for the old, for the old lady. The official then asked her to make an initial deposit. She handed her notes and coins to the teller, 
who put them together with the other notes and coins in the drawer. She yelled and said, hey, why are you mixing my money with the rest? How will you identify my notes and coins when I come back to withdraw? <laughs> so there is a little lesson there that uh, we need uh, financial literacy. And there is this news, newspaper article that uh, reported that in India, red shreds a farmer's 50,000 rupees worth of current notes in Tamil, India. So this was a, a, a farmer who had put together his, his money and uh, it was a, a, a banana farmer who sold the fruit and stashed the notes in a cotton bag. So the tragic event happened, but the bank refused to replace his notes. There is a lesson there that it's, it is important for people to know where to keep the money. So you will find that we are confronted with uh, you know, challenges that make people to behave in that manner. They don't have the knowledge. They are not literate when it comes to finance. They are not literate when it comes to uh, handling uh, cash. So we have a triple challenge of uh, unemployment, poverty, and inequality. This is common in um, developing countries. In the developing world, we have challenges of unemployment, high unemployment. Uh, unfortunately, South Africa has got, uh, is, is the highest so far in terms of unemployment, according to the World Bank records. In terms of poverty, um, uh, we also have poverty in Africa and most of the countries that are around us. Inequality, South Africa is also the highest in terms of inequality. According to the World Bank report of 2022, it has got a, 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 a Gini coefficient of 69.3, followed by, um, you know, Namibia with 59.10, Mozambique 54, um, and Botswana. So literature, the excellent literature, shows that financial exclusion, which is the other side of the inclusion, financial exclusion worsens the challenges and it also reverses the gains of um, sustainable development goals, the SDGs. But new boundaries are being pushed at various levels to achieve um, you know, financial inclusion. So these three challenges can be uh, shown in pictures. This is what we have in, in most uh, African countries. We have uh, poverty, which also you know, is the geography of poverty. It also talks about uh, inequality there. It also talks about um, uh, unemployment because most of the people who live in these uh, uh, squalor areas are not employed or they are not gainfully employed. And we also have, um, that's a picture from Namibia, but you can also see the same pictures in other countries, um, in Botswana, in, in Zimbabwe, uh, you can see these pictures in the rural areas in most cases. So it can also be called inclusive finance. If you can remember that picture, that's uh, uh, Kofi Annan, Dr. Kofi Annan, who used to be the, uh, the Secretary General of the United Nations. So he said, the stark reality is that most people who are poor in the world still lack access to sustainable financial services. Whether it is savings, credit, or insurance, the great challenge before us is to address the constraints that exclude people from full participation in the financial sector. 
together we can and must build inclusive financial sectors that help people improve their lives. So uh, I've put together three definitions there. The first definition is um, financial inclusion is about individuals and businesses that have access to affordable financial products and services. The second definition is coming from the World Bank we say that it's access to useful financial services delivered in a responsible and sustainable way. It should be responsible. It should be sustainable. There is, it should be responsible because uh, people should not be defrauded of their world that they put together. And it should be sustainable in that it should, ha it should have that ability to sustain the livelihoods of the people. The third definition is including the un unbanked, underbanked, and marginally banked. The unbanked are those people who are not part of the financial sector. They are not included in the financial sector. The underbanked, they receive a few financial services. And the marginally banked, you know, they also re you know, receive a few financial services. They are not uh, fully covered. What does financial inclusion do? It leads to social inclusion. So not just water, but clean water. And in terms of spaces, they should also have uh, spaces, space in the political uh, field, in the physical field, in the cultural field, and in the social field. They, uh, because human beings are social beings, they need to be uh, accommodated. So to have that appreciation of financial inclusion, uh, let me look at financial exclusion, which is the opposite of financial inclusion. So exclusion is, uh, involves those processes that serve to prevent certain social groups and individuals from gaining access to the financial system. So there are processes that exclude certain groups of people. And uh, there are different forms of exclusion. Uh, the first one is uh, spatial exclusion. Spatial exclusion, as the term, um, as the name says, is it looks at the uh, the financial uh, geography um, approach. That is from the perspective of economic uh, geographers, uh, political economists, and urban scientists. Access can be viewed uh, from a spatial lens. That is, people are separated simply because they are not living in certain areas. So that's why we have the urban and rural divide. So some people, especially in the rural areas, they do not have access to uh, financial services. That's why we, um, I started with the story of an old woman who was coming from the rural areas who, opened, uh, who visited the city to open a bank account. So they lack uh, proper information, they lack uh, education, Right? Then the second one is access exclusion. Access exclusion is the, restri the restriction of access through the process of risk management. That is, certain groups of people are excluded because of risk management. So the unbanked, the people that are regarded as poor, they are regarded as risky borrowers or risky players in the, in the financial system, so they are not wanted. So that's access exclusion. There is also condition exclusion. Condition exclusion, this is where conditions are attached to financial products to, uh, so that it becomes inappropriate for certain groups of people, certain uh, groups of people are given conditionalities. They cannot access because, one, they are marked as poor, they've got a poverty tag on them, so they are not wanted in the, in the financial system. So banks would say it's expensive to, uh, to service a poor person or to service a poor community. So they would rather not service the poor community because of those conditions. So they say it's, it is expensive. Then the, uh, the fourth one is 
price exclusion. Price exclusion, this is where some people can only gain access to financial uh, products at prices they cannot afford. So the price in the market, the price will do you know, the, the, the separation, the automatic uh, separation, you know, that, um, you know, the price mechanism. So where demand and supply would detect and those people who are not able, who cannot afford, would be kicked out of the market. There is also marketing uh, exclusion. Marketing exclusion, this refers to target marketing, where certain groups are targeted and other groups are not targeted. So that is the exclusion that we find there. And there is self-exclusion. Self-exclusion, this is when now people decide on their own to say, I'm not interested. I don't want to be part of the, uh, the, the financial system. So you find them uh, accessing finance from other sectors, especially the informal sector. So the informal sector is becoming important today as a result of that. Then we also have uh, social, uh, social cultural based exclusion. This looks at demographic, demographic issues such as, such as uh, gender, age, origin of the, uh, the participants, the players, and other social cultural um, features that will exclude people. So that's why we are always crying about, you know, the exclusion where you find women are more excluded than men when it comes to, to finance. Right, so we also have certain groups of people, um, you know, that is the population and we have users of financial services. Those are the included in, the included in blue and the excluded are those uh, in, in green. So there are non-users of formal financial services. There is also involuntary uh, um, uh, uh, exclusion. They are excluded involuntarily. So there is insufficient, uh, they have insufficient income. In other words, they are poor and they are high risk borrowers. So they are not wanted. So there is uh, some form of discrimination. There is lack of information. And you know, they have no access to uh, to financial services. But those that are wanted in the, in the financial sector, you find that they, um, they can only exclude themselves voluntarily. Where you find that there is no need, they don't need the financial services, they don't need money, probably they are into, uh, uh, into other forms of trade, butter trade, where they don't need cash. Okay, so, People are described as financially ex excluded if they don't have access to small loans and credit lines, if they can't build a, a credit record, because when you want a loan, you are supposed to build a credit record. But what is the future about this building of credit record? Sometimes you are not able to build a credit record. They don't have a, a secure place to save their money. So, Remember the, the farmer who had uh, 50,000 rupees that were uh, shredded by rats because there was no place for him to store the money. They have no safe, reliable and easy way to make payments. So it's, it's difficult to make payments. So such people are regarded as uh, excluded. And who are the unbanked? It's the same people, but I've got some statistics here from the Global Findex. Global, the Global Findex is, is, is a World Bank program that collects data on financial inclusion to find out whether people are included in the financial sector. So you can find, uh, in terms of age, um, in terms of age, those aged between 15 to 24 are 33% less likely to have an account. So having an account is a sign, is an indication of financial inclusion. And 40% uh, uh, less likely to have saved formally compared to those aged 25 to 64. In terms of education, this is, these are global uh, estimates. In, uh, in, term, in, in, form, in form of education, more than 
Two, uh, is likely those with tertiary education and those with primary education are two times less likely to be included. So in developing economies, adults with, with a tertiary education are more than twice as likely to have a formal account as those with a primary education or less. So education, the more you get educated, the more you get uh, included. And there is also that element of uh, gender. Find that men are 55% more included uh, and, uh, than women. Women are uh, 47%. So you will find that uh, most researchers are focusing on that to close that gap. And progress is being made. In terms of income, in developing economies, the richest 20% of the adults in a country are more than three times as likely to save in a formal financial institution as the poorest 20% of adults. Then, uh, in terms of space, the spatial, the residence, where you stay, urban residence, they are 35% as compared to the rural residence. So there is some form of ex exclusion there. Right, so you find uh, many people uh, are not involved in the, in the financial sector because it's either they are not sure whether they are uh, supported by the financial sector, whether they are going to benefit from uh, the funds that they get from the financial sector. So this, is a, this, this lady is saying, at first I borrowed money from my relatives to start a business as I was scared of the banks. So, individuals are really scared of the banks. So, that is a sign of uh, financial, uh, uh, financial exclusion. People are not comfortable to deal with banks. It could be they are scared because they don't have confidence in the banking sector, in the banking system. And if they are in the rural areas, in the rural spaces, so you find that they become so much scared and that hampers rural development. That hampers rural development. Okay, so looking at financial inclusion, uh, let me uh, take you through the historical overview of financial inclusion. Uh, financial inclusion is started as a, as a movement. We can put death there, but actually it's not easy to demarcate and give a line because um, many authors say that financial inclusion started as the microfinance movement. So it has got uh, large and powerful stakeholders in the globe who include the World Bank, the IMF, the G20, the African Development Bank, the MasterCard Foundation, ASEAN, Center for Financial Inclusion, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, social entrepreneurs such as uh, Mohammed Yunis. Probably some of you have heard of Mohammed Yunis, a Bangladeshi um, economics professor who started about the, you know, the microcredit and microfinance um, movement. So he was a Nobel Prize winner. He founded the Grameen Bank in Bangladesh and pioneered the concept of micro, the concepts of microfinance and micro credit in the 1970s. And he was popularly known uh, for giving out this statement to say microfinance would send poverty to, um, to the uh, poverty museums. So that was his uh, popular statement. So uh, he was saying microfinance is a, it's a, it's a, it's a product that includes the unbanked. Those people that are denied access to finance. So he founded the, the, the Grameen Bank, and the world over, many countries uh, tried to develop a similar product in the different, in different countries. Uh, you see, uh, as, as part of my you know, uh, journey, I, also, I was also in, involved partly in that. So you find in Kenya, they've got what is called the, the K-Rep of Kenya, 
which is a, a bank for the poor, and many other um, parts of the, the world, they've followed the Grameen uh, example. So like I was saying, in the 1970s, it started the uh, microfinance movement. 1995 to 1998, uh, the World Bank uh, developed what is called the consultative group to assist the poor, the CGAP. Uh, this was an initiative for sustainable microfinance. In 2010, the Global Partnership for Financial Inclusion, GPFI, was established by the G20 leaders to show that it's, it's an important aspect. 2011, in Mexico, the Maya Declaration, so this, there was a commitment. So ambitious universal financial access, UFA, goals for 2020, to enable one billion people to gain access to finance were established. So this indicates, it's an indicator that financial inclusion is an important uh, issue. 2018 to date, we have financial inclusion, it's, it, it's becoming a, a, a global concern. Right, so let me uh, give you a, a brief of my journey. Uh, my journey, when you look at uh, what I have done, you find that I have been into this, the issue of uh, financial inclusion. My interaction with uh, communities and even my research. 1993, I was a school teacher then, uh, but I was invited by a colleague who had, who had gone to the US to study. Uh, he studied uh, a master's in um, community development, he came back and he invited me, uh, we were teaching together, and he said, let's go, we want to form an organization to fight against, against poverty. This is a newspaper article, the uh, Africa is saying Zimbabwe poor men's bank lends out to the poor. So you can see it's in Masuingo, Zimbabwe, which is my home country, uh, my, my hometown. So, so a Masuingo based uh, organization Credit Against Poverty uh, has lent out some 650,000 Zim dollars then, right, to 788 people. So that's a newspaper uh, article. So I was, I, I was invited to become a board, a board member. Right, and in 2011, uh, I graduated. Um, with a PhD, and my topic was rural uh, microfinance and poverty alleviation. That was indicating the, the interest in that, uh, in that area. 2011, 2012, sorry, I started publishing on microfinance and related issues. So some of the, some of the works, uh, you know, uh, the selected ones, 2014, I published uh, uh, innovative rural financing in Zimbabwe, a case of cattle banking. Cattle banking is a financial uh, inclusive program that promotes banking, uh, you know, by farmers. But the cash moves, so it's cattle banking. <laughs> so, you know, what the paper was saying is that you know, farmers can use cattle as part of their cash, as a store of value. So this was, during that time, remember during this time, inflation in Zimbabwe, those who read news and the economists, they know that the inflation, the Zimbabwean inflation was very high. It was over a thousand percent, right? So inflation was, was very high and it was, appropriate to have cattle for, uh, you know, for the bank. So there was a bank in Zimbabwe, a bank which was uh, involved in cattle banking. Right, then in 2014 again, I, I, I wrote another, another paper on Ecofarma in Zimbabwe. Ecofarma is a, it's, it's a product that was developed by, uh, Econet is a, a, a a service provider, a, a telephone service provider, but 
it also offers some form of financial services. So Ecofarmer is a, a product, an insurance product for farmers. So this paper was uh, uh, published in 2014. Recently, 2020, I also pub pub uh, published about a migrant entrepreneurship and it was also talking about inclus inclusiveness, including and, uh, social integration, making sure that migrants are also uh, included in the system. Recently, 2022, I published uh, a paper with my uh, postdoc, uh, Financial Inclusion on uh, Entrepreneurship in South African Townships, Lessons for Practitioners and uh, Policy Makers from Literature. And another one I published with my mentee does um, uh, informal finance matter for micro and small business, uh, small businesses in Africa, that's 2022. And uh, these are accredited journals. And another one on the policy roadmap, roadmap for sustainable informal businesses. It was also talking about financial inclusion. And then um, currently, work in progress, there is work that is going on uh, research, I'm uh, researching with my mentee, a Kekud research project that we are uh, uh, doing there is entitled Transforming Livelihoods Through Financial Inclusion. And uh, my mentorship pro uh, project again, where I'm helping a colleague to uh, develop publications so that they can also realize um, up the ladder in terms of promotion, and also hosting postdoctoral fellows researching on fin financial inclusion and SDGs. So that's what uh, I'm, I'm, I'm doing. Right, so in terms of financial inclusion, the question could be, is there any attention? Are other researchers giving attention to financial inclusion? Using bibliometric analysis, I try to search to find out whether it is uh, correct that financial inclusion is matters in other parts of the world. You can see that uh, there are publications that are going on in China. I used Voice Viewer, a bibliometric uh, uh, analysis software that you can use to check the relationships. So you can see China there and United, uh, United States. You can also see South Africa there is also involved and in um, financial inclusion, Indonesia, India, France, Nigeria, ETC, Pakistan, they are also researching on financial inclusion. What about in terms of organizations? You can also see that uh, universities are involved in uh, research on financial inclusion, including the University of uh, South Africa there. Uh, we also need to feature at some point there. There is Makerere University, uh, uh, Covent University, uh, universities in China, ETC. So with our work, I believe we will also feature in that display. Right. So what can be achieved, uh, what can be achieved through financial inclusion? Financial inclusion uh, benefits individuals, businesses, and economies, uh, economies in various ways. But uh, my interest is more on the, uh, you know, the economies when it comes to the world, the globe at large. You find that we, uh, we need to see the globe developing in terms of sustainable development goals. Can we, are we able to achieve sustainable development goals as a result of financial inclusion? So the G20 made a commitment to adopt financial inclusion as a major support towards achievement of the 2030 agenda of SDGs. We know the, the, the 17 uh, SDGs and you know, the Economist Intelligence Unit uh, stated that financial inclusion is now recognized as one of the essential building blocks supporting key elements of the SDGs. So when you look at the different SDGs, uh, the United Nations 
Capital Development Fund, UNCDF, believes that eight of the 17 SDGs are relevant to financial uh, inclusion. They can be achieved through financial inclusion. For example, SDG 1, eradica eradicating poverty. We have an example of the M-Pesa uh, in Kenya. Uh, it lifted 2% of the Kenyan population out of poverty, according to the McKinsey uh, Global Institute. SDG 2, ending hunger. Malawing farmers with new bank accounts increased equipment purchase by 13% and crop output by 21%. SDG 3, health and well-being uh, uh, can be promoted. That is, people have got access to health services if they are included in the financial system. SDG 5, gender equality. For example, the Kenyan female vendors who opened bank accounts increased stocks by 37%. Percent. That's uh, according to the World Bank. And also, uh, SDG, uh, SDG number eight, promoting economic growth, right? There is evidence to that. SDG nine, promoting industry and inno innovation and infrastructure. Financial inclusion can also support that. SDG 10, reducing inequality. That can also be done through financial inclusion. If people are part of the financial system, inequality can be reduced. And the last one, SDG 17, partnership to promote savings, mobilization for investment. Savings are a result of financial inclusion. And if a community saves, then there will be investment in that community. Economists always say savings translate to uh, investment. So, uh, we should also try to save as individuals. Organizations should also try to save. You should have a, a somewhere where you throw in those coins, don't throw them away. Throw them somewhere. The World Bank says, no, it's not eight. Uh, it's not eight SDGs that are, can be addressed, that can be achieved through financial inclusion. The World Bank says 11. So it added the... Uh, three there, uh, so quality education can also be achieved through financial inclusion. Clean water and sanitation can be achieved. Responsible consumption and production can also be achieved through uh, financial inclusion. What is responsible consumption? People know what to, uh, what to consume, so they are not careless if they know how to manage the, their finances. But I also say, I want to add to that and say, no, they are not only 11, they are 14. So we can add uh, affordable and clean energy. People have access to clean energy if they are financially included. So climate action, SDG number 13, climate action is also, can also be achieved through financial inclusion. I didn't include one of the papers where uh, we published with a colleague on um, climate finance and green finance. So it's, it also touches on financial inclusion. So once included, climate action can also be a reality. People can understand uh, the, 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 the climate and they can also make sure that um, you know, they have climate programs climate action programs, so as to uh, fight against, you know, you know the, the, uh, the problems of uh, you know, climate change that we are facing today. Peace, justice, and strong institutions can also be improved through financial inclusions. Institutions, even the family institution, in the home, if you are financially included, if a wife is also part of the a home financial system, then it becomes a strong institution. People always fight in the homes because there is some form of uh, financial exclusion. But with financial inclusion, then they can work as a, as a, as a team. So you find that it's, it's a reality in the communities, it's a reality in business, it's a reality in economies. So progress is being made the world, world over where you find that in low-income countries, 
from 2011 to 2017, they've made that kind of progress, inclusion from 13% to 35%. In low middle income countries, from 29 to uh, 58%. Upper middle income countries, they've achieved up to 73%. And high income countries, 94% inclusion. So uh, the third world is still um, lagging. So what about the future? What are we saying about the future now? For, for the future, financial inclusion can be uh, realized if we have government and policy support. Governments um, in the third world should be able to build national inclusion strategies, national financial inclusion strategies. They should also create policies to protect consumers. So they should create uh, frameworks to protect the unbanked against the forms of exclusion and exploitation. Then the way forward also is about uh, f developing the financial infrastructure. How do we develop the financial infrastructure? So we are saying into the future, let's have, uh, you know, what my um, DOS called the, the solution statement as opposed to the problem statement. The solution statement should be developing the digital economy upscaling fintech uh, financial firms, financial uh, technologies. So the question is, can the internet and the mobile forms uh, spare inclusion of the financially excluded poor? So digitalization and financial inclusion, uh, they become uh, enablers. So we also have use of artificial intelligence and data anal uh, analytics for credit scoring because credit scoring, in most cases, is you, you score your credits by buying from different shops. But now they're saying there are other people who cannot visit these shops, but they also need a loan to start a business. How do we do it? With artificial intelligence, you know, they can use, they can use your mobile phone, collect data from your mobile phone, and now analyze your behavior from your mobile phone, then that data is enough to, uh, you know, to have scores that you can use to access credit. They can also use satellite images, use of satellite images to say, for example, a farmer, if you've got a farm or in a, in a community, they can use satellite images to collect data using artificial intelligence so that, that that data can be used to assess whether you uh, have got uh, appropriate scores. Then universities also need to establish financial inclusion research centers. There is need for more empirical research so as to avoid uh, reliance on anecdotal data. So it's important to have research and there is also a need to widen the financial net. This, is, uh, no, this will uh, promote the SDGs, generate employment, wealth, reduce poverty, inequality, hunger, ATC. There is also a need to develop some models, models that can, be, that can support financial inclusion, that can be used to drive financial inclusion. Recently, we uh, have a, a, a discussion, a discourse about the theoretical frameworks that uh, underpin financial inclusion. You find that we don't have mature theories that explain financial inclusion. So it's important to build models, develop theories that can be used for financial inclusion. McKinsey, the uh, Global Institute, has predicted saying through uh, digitalization of the financial space, we can achieve the following. 3.7 uh, trillion uh, GDP boost by 2025 globally and 95 million new jobs globally and 1.6 billion newly included individuals into the financial sector 
4.2 trillion in new deposits, 110 billion annual reduction in government leakage, and 2.1 trillion in new credit. How is government uh, leakage reduced? Government leakage is reduced through financial inclusion when you are using digitalization because it's a safe way of, doing, of carrying out transactions. So, you, because you'll be using the, the PIN system and the softwares are, um, you know, they are watertight, they can be used to protect individuals. So it avoids uh, leakages and you can also have, have an, a, a very transparent audit trail when you are carrying out transactions. Unlike a situation where the government is giving out people cash so that they can go around and distribute to the poor. So if they give uh, uh, 100,000 to go and distribute to the poor, what gets to the poor is 10,000. The other part disappears. But when you are using the digital platforms, there is no way, there is no interception. You cannot intercept it. It goes to the beneficiaries. But where there is no digitalization, the problem continues. So that's the prediction. So my concluding remarks, uh, uh, literature says that um, it has demonstrated that there is Im immense contribution of financial inclusion. It helps to fight poverty, unemployment, and inequality. So there is need for deliberate policy intentions by governments in developing countries. Use financial inclusion to foster sustainable development goals. Digitize the financial system for inclusivity. Uh, so I argue that the future of financial inclusion is achieved not only by technology, but also by acceptance, behavior, and collaboration that is synergy, that is built around ecosystems, strong ecosystems. So universities have a challenge. They've got an important role to play through research, theorization, model development, ETC. So an underlying thesis in, is that financial inclusion benefits individuals, businesses, and economies in many ways. Uh, I hope this one will play so that we can uh, hear the concluding remarks from Right. Okay. It's, it's not playing. I'm not sure what, what happened to... There's supposed to be a video there. Okay. The launch of digital financial services in Africa led to an increase in the number of people accessing mobile money solutions where banks never established branches before, like in rural villages. The access to mobile money services increased daily per capita consumption levels of households. Today, financial inclusion is a means to an end. Yolanda Cuba, Group Chief Digital and Fintech Officer at MTN, joins CNBC Africa to discuss how digital financial inclusion can be a catalyst for equitable development and economic growth. Okay, I want to thank you. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, I would like to reflect on a few <coughs> people and thank them. I want to thank uh, God for my life. I want to thank my dear wife, uh, you know, and our three children. We were blessed by three children, um, Hannah, Steve, uh, Stephen Jr., and uh, Hope. Okay, so uh, Hannah is, is a student here. She's master's in the built environment. And uh, Steve has just completed, graduated with <coughs> Uh, his first degree uh, with uh, Midland State University and Hope is uh, doing her advanced level. She's aspiring to be a, a medical doctor. 
So that's the, the family. I also want to thank my, my late parents. You know, the VC announced that. So like what the VC was saying, he, he, he did not allow us to, to, you know, to go absent, to miss classes. The other day we, we had this experience. We, we had visited him, he was teaching at, in another school. He was a teacher for more than 30 years. And um, we visited him, but on a Monday we failed to go to school because we're coming from his from from <clears throat> from the school, and we had carried some items to go and give our mother. So when he when he came home over the weekend, the mother reported to say, you know, they didn't go to school. <laughs> it was myself and my brother, you know. Guess what? He didn't even sympathize with us. We were given a lot of, uh, <laughs> we were treated. So, <laughs> so, so that's why I don't believe in absenteeism and some of the students in one of the, one of the uh, universities says, he doesn't, he doesn't miss a lecture, what is the problem with him? Even when flu is going in stacking rounds, he, he's always here, what is his problem? <laughs> Right, and I also want to thank uh, uh, Pastor Dupree and his wife, uh, Pastor Wilbert, who could not be present here, and the Big Gamago family, and the DDS family, my dean, colleagues in the faculty, my DOS, uh, and you know, all my invited guests. Thank you so much for listening to this uh, presentation. I'm starting this inaugural all over again, okay? <laughs> but it's going to be a mess. <laughs> uh, Professor Margo, it is my privilege to congratulate you on a great inaugural lecture on the future of financial inclusion. The pathways are so clear. So your research is not only scientifically rigorous, but also pan-African and of great benefit to evidence based policy intervention at the regional level. Its focus on socio-economic transformation and livelihood enhancement gives the research a high impact value score associated with the ambitions of the Africa Agenda 2063 and the SDGs. Please continue your high caliber and high value work. Congratulations and best wishes on your career further and with the task lying ahead. Please give Promago a warm round of applause. <laughs> May I also express the gratitude of our university for your contributions and especially relay the thanks of our executive, the governing council and the entire university community. I would now like to take the opportunity to share a message with you from the president of the Alumni Association. Dear Prof. Margo, congratulations on your inaugural lecture. The Alumni Association looks forward to your support and involvement in our activities to mark this very special occasion in your academic career and your time at Nelson Mandela University. On behalf of the Association, I would like to present you with this symbolic gift. Best wishes for all your future endeavors. In closing, I would like to convey our thanks to those who are attending this inaugural lecture in person and virtually. Your interest in the work of Prof. Margo and that of our university is much appreciated. Thanks to Prof. Mutwa for the welcoming remarks, Prof. Hendrik Lloyd, for the Executive Dean of Business and Economic Sciences for introducing Prof. Margo to us. And thanks also to Prof. Margo's special guests, friends and family, his colleagues in the faculty, his late parents, his wife, 
siblings and his broader family and in-laws and of course the spiritual family at the local assembly. Thanks also to the institutional governance team in the office of our registrar, our communications and marketing team and our ICT team that made the inaugural lecture possible. This brings to a close the inaugural lecture of Professor Margo. You are invited for light refreshments in the foyer. May I request the audience to stand whilst the academic profession, procession leaves the venue.